Yeah, it was very primitive, but what, and that's why you stayed. You know, if it, I was said to Brooke earlier, if it is, if I'd have walked into it now the way it is, I wouldn't have stayed. They got water, they got medical. Assuming there was someone doing the clinic runs and doing the running around, there wouldn't have been any reason to stay. It's being done. But before, that wasn't there. There was no water, there was no clinic runs. The housing was atrocious. Well, the get moving bit's a good question because I didn't know the get moving bit. You've got to look back and sort of say, okay, you wouldn't have gone there as it was and said, oh, we need to get the children into school. That wasn't an option because the houses were terrible. The kids had to work to survive. Um, there was inadequate food. So what happened over the years was, you know, the first year was watch and listen and pay attention and see what you can do. Hence the rubber boots. But then as you progress along, then you start to get the housing better. It was pretty obvious that when it's in the rainy season and the houses leaked and you get old people and no money and so on. But the whole, one of the points of put, getting the housing sorted out was to also find a way to get the community to work together. You know, what I said was, if I go and buy all this material, you come and help me get it, we'll come back and we'll fix up these seven houses because that lady there can't do it and this old guy here can't do it. So everyone will get a roof, but you've got to help one another to get them all on the, in the house, which is what happened. That was the beginning of like, if I can just get to work together and help one another, we can move forward. And then of course there was the food issue. We supplied a lot of food there to get people, you know, back to somewhat form of health, making sure children were fed. A lot of children weren't getting fed properly. We had babies dying of malnutrition. That wasn't so much a food thing, that was a, a lack of understanding. Women, some women had babies and they didn't know how to look after them. They were feeding babies on condensed milk because someone said that's the good way to go. I've actually heard people say, you really shouldn't breastfeed, that's not very good for the baby. So there's an education issue that we've dealt with and fixed. That's not... That. So then you move from there to the water, once you realise that the water's no good. So we put the water in, the first water, which we're still doing. So as you progress along, you can look back and say, yeah, you have to get the housing fixed, you have to get the water fixed, you have to get the medical fixed. And then you can start to look at it, the next part of the project. So what I was seeing was there was nowhere safe or comfortable, for, especially with mothers with children and kids to hang out at. So that's why I wanted to put up a community centre, which we did. Um, put up the community centre, it worked pretty well. You know, there's a place to go. We eventually managed to put a TV in there. It only showed CDs, but then you've got entertainment and the you can get a hot drink, especially if the weather's bad, and a place where they can be and feel comfortable. There were places around there you could hang out, but it was a lot of guys and a bit of gambling going on and guys drinking. And I wanted to basically give the women and children a place to go. That worked well, put that in. So that was the next level. And then the education, we got to the education part. The education started off uh, there was a woman I found in Mesot, Burmese lady, uh, middle-aged. She was a political prisoner for 10 years. Uh, I really like her a lot and she's, her English is perfect. So I approached her and she said, yeah, I can take some kids and teach them. So she was quite surprised that I'd asked her because she didn't, no one's ever asked her before. So I took a couple of kids in and mainly because I wanted to see how this was going to go. I, I was looking for conversational English. She went a different way altogether. She taught them English in the correct way. Every word these kids can talk in English, they can also spell. And nouns, pronouns, all the things that you, know, you need to know in English. She's taught them that. So I could see it was going well and I asked her if she could take some more and she took four. 
And then I went back and said, I've got a lot more kids that want to come. She said, I can't do any more. And I said, well, why is that? She said, I've only got four chairs. So I said, we can fix that problem. <laughs> We've got about 17 in there now, 15 to 17. It fluctuates between two. But it's so important to them. They come out from the garbage dump, they go into Mosot, it's a nice house, and they're getting taught English. So we've now solved the problem of communications. So we've gone from housing, medical, food, the, the, the community centre, now we've got the English going. So now we're looking, OK, how does this go from here? We, we need to teach life skills. So we set up in the community centre, we set up uh, a friend of mine came through, he's Burmese, he's a musician, he knows computers. We got a couple of old computers, they started to learn computers. Now they're doing English, Thai, computers. This is a, these are very important life skills if you want to go forward, especially if you're Burmese. So this is all going well. Then we've relocated a school in Maysot called CDC, which is um, Children's, Child's Children's Development Centre. And I approached them and said, I'd like to get some kids into the school. Seemed fine. We filled in the paperwork. I'm actually the guardian for most of these kids. Did all the paperwork, paid the fees, got them some uniforms. They're in school. Uh, then we had a lot, everyone is watching now. Okay, they go to school. So we had five in school. After that term had gone through, we asked the parents, would you like to, any children that want to go to school, put your hand up. We've got 20 in there now. We've got 20 children going to school. So to go back to the beginning of the question, or we never had a blueprint. We never had a plan. We wanted, I wanted to fix housing and build a little bit of community awareness and how to do that. I wanted to cure the water problem. So after you've gone through that journey and getting the kids into school, now we know what to do. If this situation was to come again, whether it be, I don't know whether it would come again, but we know how to approach it now. You don't send kids to school soaking wet without breakfast. We put a little kitchen in the community centre. We pay someone $15 a week to cook, make sure they've got breakfast in the morning and their little food carriers have got food to go to school. So they've got lunch at school. When you look at it, it's really, there's no rocket science here, it's quite straightforward. But of course, everything on the first time round when you're doing it, it, it can be problematic. But we've done it and it works. Yeah, that's a good question actually, because some, no problem at all. But what you're doing is between, especially between the ages of 11 and 12 and 13, they're part of the workforce. They have to work to keep the family together, to, to, to buy anything. So some are better off than others. So when that situation comes up, I negotiated with the families and said, okay, look, your kid wants to go to school, and it's, especially the ones that didn't push the kid forward. You knew there was a problem. I know you want your kid to go to school, but you're not telling me why. Well, it was a simple matter. They couldn't afford to give up the kid from the workforce. But also, as poor as they are, and in Thailand, it's not the, one of the wealthiest countries, they've got to have three uniforms, two pairs of shoes. They've got to have their hair cut and dyed. They've got to have a backpack. They've got to have school stuff. For one, it's expensive. I've got 20 of them in school. So it's daunting for people that don't really have any money we solved the problem of the workforce problem by saying, OK, we'll give you a bag of rice. And we're there to support you. We're not just going to give you a bag of rice and walk away. You tell me the problems, we'll find a way to fix it. It's easy, really, isn't it? It wasn't a major problem. It just had to do it. So we did it.
I think it's a global problem. We're not just talking about everywhere in the world. We all know about Haiti. We know about Katrina. And if you start looking around the world and turning some of these stones over, you'll see that the organisations, and you just said, they've preconceived ideas. They've said, OK, we need to do this and this and this, but is that the right way to go? And how many people does it take? So I think you have to look at the problem very objectively and say, well, what is actually needed? An example is uh, when I first went to Mesot, I met a, a small NGO, this guy in particular was very interested. He didn't like talking to people very much, but I managed to get some conversation out of him. And he started telling me about when the big tsunami came up in Thailand, the NGO types and organisations that went in there was overwhelming, which is heartening. People really wanted to do something to help but they wanted to build the houses. They wanted to supply the materials. They knew how to build houses. They know where they want the house, they know how to build them. So if you can supply the, what's needed, which in this case was building materials, you've done the job. I mean, a little bit of guidance. I call it soft management. It's nice to have someone around to help with the problems that come up and feedback. But you don't need an army of people with nails and hammers and trying to do the whole thing. There should be partnerships, they should be understanding. And in, in some cases, I think we've lost that a little bit. Oh, I, I'm very, very, feel very strong about keeping families together. They grow and learn together. And I've seen it happen. That's the difference. It's not just words. You, some people that have never been anywhere near a place like this say, oh, we should do this and keep the families together or we should do this and put them in boarding schools. I think you have to look and understand the whole process. I, wasn't, I don't have a boarding school anyway, I, but I wanted to keep the families together because I understood the families, I understood how they work together. And what's come of that is that the kids are going to school, they come home, they still do a bit of work. And I don't have a problem with that. Um, but the parents have changed, especially the women. They're getting more involved. They're proud of their kids now. Their kids are not speaking English. Their, their whole demeanour and their attitude in life is different. They're more helpful uh, in the family and to others. So you wouldn't want to take that out of the family. You want to keep that in the family so the family can get some strength and grow together, especially in Asia where it's a very family orientated culture. So. I feel very strong about families staying together and doing everything you can to keep them together. That was a surprise to me when I saw that. There's, you know, the kids are really bright. I'm very impressed with them. They're very proud of themselves and I think everybody in the whole community is proud of them because of the way they have become more social, Friendly, playing together, confidence has, has come up amazingly. I, we've still got a lot of kids that aren't in school that are still working. So we can see the difference. It's not that, oh, they're all doing great. Yeah, they're not doing so good. These ones are doing great. And they were all like this, and now they're, we've got some like this. So um, we've got this little community centre, and the kids are going to school. And I came over one Saturday to find one of the girls there. She's, I think she's 12 or maybe 13 now. And she's doing Thai lessons with the seven or eight year olds. I never asked her. She did it. And I was like, wow, this is very cool. And then she comes up to me and says, Fred, I need a whiteboard and I need um, some pens, I need some books. So I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm teaching, I'm running class. Oh, pretty cool. So you encourage that, of course. And they're still doing it. And one did it, now the others are doing it. So the things they feel good about, they all want to be teachers. But they're teaching the other kids things they need to know. And Thai is a very important language if you live in Thailand. But they're teaching them English. They've got computers. They're teaching one another computer skills. And that knock-on effect is growing. That's spreading all the way through the community. No. 
No, there, there's, there, there are some changes going on where they're trying to modernise this landfill garbage dump and if they modify it and bring it up to scratch, which I think could happen, my was always hoping that they would get a good job. There's nothing wrong with working in a landfill and recycling. And I've said this to people that some people tend to look down upon them and just say, oh, well, they're working in the garbage. I say to them, they're recycling your garbage. You're not, they're doing it. So they're a bit more of a benefit than a lot of people if they're taking care of the, gar uh, you know, the, the garbage, the plastic, glass, etc. So they've got, a, I think they've got a high value. They're just not being recognised. Uh, what was the other part of that question? It's about, it's not about the future. Is there any change? Yeah, so if this area turns into a, a proper mechanised garbage or recycling centre and they get jobs, which they've been promised if this happens in the next few years, well, it doesn't get any better. Now they've got a regular job. They're working in a recycling plant. No one's even to think twice of looking at them. They're just people working in a recycle centre, as in America, as in Britain, France, everywhere in the world. They're just, it's another job. And that's what it should be. But yeah, the, the, their legal status has improved. These people have a value they can get. And a lot of them have got cards now that allow them to be in the area and to work. Uh, that, that is an improvement. And I think that's going to continue to improve because someone's got to do this job. Uh, they have a problem, they can't go far. I mean, they can't, going to Maysot for some of them can be a little bit tricky. That's why I, I take them to Maysot in the truck, I take them to the clinic. The truck. <laughs> oh, that truck's seen some life. Uh, what do you want to know about the truck? Well, what it's the truck, and it seems to be a very important element in that. The truck's the critical. Without the truck, we haven't got anything. And we've got one truck. It's a Ford Ranger, four-wheel drive. It's, it's high off the ground, it has to be, because the conditions and the roads, especially in the rainy season, are terrible. We often get it stuck for a day or two. Uh, but it's everything. It's the clinic. It's going to Maysot, and now it's a school bus. Every morning I load up 20 kids, take them to school. Four o'clock, I'll bring them back. No truck, no school. So right now I'm out looking to buy another truck and trying to get a bit of help with some funding on that. Uh, the, the truck is very well known there. I, can, I know how they feel when they see the truck. It's, uh, and it's very distinctive. It's a strange colour. It's a kind of a ready brown colour. I bought it. It was almost new when I bought it. And uh, now it's got no tailgate and the sides have fell off and there's bits dropping off all over the place. But mechanically it's very sound, but it's a disaster to look at. That's fine, no problem there. It's a truck. Well, my lifestyle is actually very simple, which suits me fine. Uh, by the nature of what I do, and I'm very driven, I. I like what I do. I feel very, I don't want to say comfortable, but it's like in family, you don't think of it as a job. It's what you do. You don't, you know, you have days when you go, God, I haven't stopped today and I've got this to do tomorrow. You can complain and whine, but it's what you do. I'm not paid. This is my choice and it makes a big difference. So I did have a house there for some time and I wasn't comfortable, it was a big house. They're not expensive, but it's a house, and then with the house, are you gonna cook, are you gonna go out, you gotta clean and pay the bills, etc. And it really wasn't working for me. I found this little guest house. It cost me $270 a month. I have air conditioning, a television. They make and clean the room, make the bed, clean the room. But no bills, no maintenance, nothing. I come home, open the door, and there's the bed made, which is really cool. It's a small room. I've got my car park outside, so my car's safe. And, and I like the place, there's lots of trees in it. Uh, as I say, it works really well for me, personally. Because I do do, my, my time is spent at the garbage dump, not 
at the house. A lot of people say to me, well, what about an office or this? I say, well, why would I want an office? If I'm sitting in an office, I'm obviously not supplying fresh water or looking after people who need some help. Uh, this question's come up before, and there's times I've gone home, it's pouring me rain in the rainy season, there's mud everywhere. I've left behind kids that are, and families, and don't forget we've got a lot of elderly we deal with, that, you know, the house might not be that watertight, the wind's blowing, is the house going to be there tomorrow? And I'm lying in a very comfortable bed thinking, I've got everything. I'm fine. It's almost like a guilt trip at times. You know, I feel uncomfortable, so, well, well. But obviously I've got to take care of myself. People say, you know, if you can't take care of yourself, well, then you've got another set of problems. I'm comfortable with my lifestyle. What we should be doing is trying to find a way that we can stop doing it. Now, eyes to Burma should be sort of saying, okay, it might be three years away, it might be five years away. You're always going to create more of the stuff that you're trying to solve. But we really should be sort of saying, we need to get rid of that problem. We need to get rid of this problem. Where it comes up against a bit of a stumbling block is when you're educating kids. There is really no end to that one. I mean, the kids now between 12 and 14 that are really doing well, should we be looking at college or university or maybe vocational training? You know, what are they going to be good at? That one you can't say goodbye to, but you should be able to sort of say goodbye to water, food, housing. Those are the things you should be fixing. So we've got that one down. We don't need to do that anymore. Education's slightly different. So where's Eyes to Burma going? We want to get kids educated. I No, it's not actually. I, I always felt that ideally they should be looking at Burma. That doesn't mean they can't go into Thailand, which they can if they have the skills, but Burma is slowly opening up. There's a lot of issues still going on, but in my, my head it wouldn't be nice if they could walk back into Burma and get a good job in a hotel or in the tourist industry. They can drive, they can speak English and Thai, they can work a computer, they're must be a lot of jobs for kids like that. And of course, we've, what we've got to take into account is what they might want to do. If it's good enough for us to get it and what things we want, why shouldn't it be for others? Why do we keep restricting that? So, oh, well, you really can't do that, you can do this. They should have the same options that we've had. Everyone should have that option. That should be the goal. There's a lot of things that run parallel here. Um, the needs. There is no electric, we're short of food or a lack of food. So, you know, let's get some food out there. Well, we're donating the food. Uh, within a group of 100 people, you've got to think of it like a small town in any country. And what a lot of people do, and we're all probably guilty of it in some ways, when we see poverty and lots of people living in a, in a rough situation, do we think they're all the same? Some work harder than others, some are smarter than others, some have got a plan. We don't know what they're, what they're trying to do. They're living there, they're existing, but where are, they, where are they trying to go? So we started off donating food to everyone and then looking for the needs, what they needed. Uh, but it was a bit of a... Every time you took something over there as donations, you're swamped. Everybody wants to get their bit. It's not, it's not helping with dignity, uh, but I understood it. You know, it's something free, I want it. I haven't got anything. We live a day-to-day -day basis. They don't, live, they don't plan very much for tomorrow. So the rice was donated. I'm still looking for ways to help. And then I started taking over some small lights, headlights and batteries, which I was also donating. Well, you've got nearly 500 people. That's a lot of lights, that's a lot of batteries. And every time I turned up, I was swamped again. You know, this was not gonna last for long. Also taking over things like toothbrushes, soap, uh, shampoo. 
things that were needed. But once again, they just come at you and you can do the figures pretty quick and go, this is not gonna last for too long. We've got to start looking at this. I'm a great believer in karma and letting things come to you sometimes. And what was really obvious was they're working at night, they need the light to work at night and they need the lights. And work tools, they're like a sickle. They use to scrape through the garbage to get whatever they want, which is plastic bottles and so forth. So I was supplying a lot of batteries, a lot of lights and tools. What happened was productivity went up. They were earning more money. I didn't plan that. That's just what my observation was that, hang on, this is kind of cool. So there's a bit of a gap between the time we're talking now to the next stage, but all of a sudden I decided to, I'm going to start charging 10 bar for the batteries, which is exactly what they cost me. That was a difficult transition because one day it's free, and the next day it's 10 bar. Now you're the bad guy. <laughs> but within four to five weeks, it was working perfect. People would just come up to the car, batteries, 10 bar. They had the 10 bar, they'd earned the 10 bar already. It's just that they got so used to everything being free. So we did that with the batteries and the lights, and I sell them to them at cost. But because I know everybody there and what's going on, I know who can't afford it. I know who's in trouble. So I would say 70% of that is we just sell it at cost. The knives were the same. We subsidised the knives because they're a bit more expensive. Uh, it works fine. We lose a little bit each time. But once again, it works. Now they're only asking for it when they want it. And this is a dignity thing. It is a, it's showing that you, know, you can make a change, it's a subtle change, and it helps. Then it started on the rice. You know, we were always helping out with the rice, but you're gonna run out of money, and then there's gonna be no rice. So I put it to a few people, I said, for rice, 500 bar. I knew this family could afford it. So that was the beginning of the rice. We know the ones that can't afford it, and we also know the ones that, every Sunday we give out donations of rice to the elderly to help them along. The rice was a difficult push at first, but then I found out when they buy rice, which they do in town, they're paying 900 baht. They didn't know where to buy it, and that's what they had to pay for it. We're selling it at 500, we lose 30 baht, which is a dollar on every sack that we sell. Now I feel that we're helping them with their dignity, we're respecting our donors, we're not just throwing donors' money away, we're finding ways to protect that, and the money that we're not spending is going to education. Well, obviously when you first started, there is no support network. You've got to, it's something you build. But once again, like everything else, there wasn't a clear direction of well, who do I want to support me? What is this support? But uh, in a lot of countries, we're quite used to foreigners being the real wealthy people. We pay more. Thailand's no exception to that. Um, the price always goes up to the foreigner. I've managed to build a uh, within my sock, a network of wholesalers. I knew I needed to get to wholesalers, not out the shop or off the market. So I built up an, a, a really good relationship with wholesalers where I can buy in bulk and get very good prices. But there's also all the little individual shops like where I buy the knives, for instance. I've got a great relationship there. A Muslim man, got a shop that sells all sorts of knives and stuff. Dealt with him for years, we've got, become good friends. I get a good price. I don't get ripped off. Because if I'm getting ripped off, so are the donors. And I'm very, very conscious of that. You know, money only goes for so long so far. So there's that part of the relationship. Many people know us, and it all started when I started taking the kids into Mesop. And then they started to work out, you know, this guy that keeps buying batteries and knives, what is he doing? Well, they found out, and the kids talk. You can't shut them up. <laughs> they talk to everybody. So they're your, they're your little messengers. So within a couple of years, people are realizing that 
okay, he's the guy that got, takes the kids to school at the garbage dump and he does this and all the things we do. So that's been an invaluable part of setting up that network. Uh, food, we buy a lot of food in the market. It's cheaper. And the reason we buy a lot of food in the market is because we have elderly there that need help and for kids to go to school in the morning, they need food. So I go to the market. I don't get cheated. Everyone knows what's going on. I get good prices. But as I was buying the food now, I don't even do that. I take some of the mothers and the kids to the market, let them loose. They go and buy what they need. Uh, some of this Burmese food is very, especially the spices and the things they like, I don't even understand them. So I could buy basics like chicken and rice. So now their diet's better. They're going back to dignity. They're buying it. I help, well, I do finance that, that type of food. But so, you know, they're, they're taking more control of their lives. They couldn't do this before we went there. Now we're trying to build a network with people like where I get the truck fixed constantly. Big garage. I'm working on getting a couple of lads in there for vocational training to learn mechanics. Where the kids get their hair, hair washed and cleaned for school or cut got great relationships with the hairdressers. So the process is building and it's moving along that I don't have to do much more. They just take over for themselves. They know that they've met people, they can talk to people, they can ask the questions that I can't ask. Well, you learn a lot about yourself you learn more about who you are. Um, I never had kids. I've learned a lot about kids and it's great. I love it. I think I would say to everyone, don't have kids till you get to about 65. <laughs> you can deal with them then. But they are, you know, they're the driving force, really. They're just a pleasure to be around. They're, they're so much fun. Every day I laugh. Uh, Watch them develop and grow is a real kick in the pants. It's just incredible to watch them. So that for me has been a, a good experience and a major learning experience. But I've also learned what poverty is. Um, it's not a pretty thing. Poverty is probably one of the biggest problems we've got on the globe. We, we talk about solving the problem of overpopulation, wildlife, deforestation. If you look at it, and draw the line back, it nearly always goes back to poverty. Now we know there's other things in there, but poverty, if you could get rid of the poverty, you'd get rid of nearly all these, you'd find a way to start getting rid of these problems. Uh, poverty, you live day to day, you don't plan. If you're not planning, well, what are you doing? You're trying to survive day to day. It's like, you know, if there's a, a dolphin swimming along the river and you're sitting on the side of the, the banks with your kids all starving hungry, you're not going to turn around and say, oh no, we've saved the dolphins. You're going to eat the dolphins. And it's the same with, you know, unwanted pregnancies. There's a lot of unwanted pregnancies. You know, if you could reduce that, you reduce many, many problems. So the learning process goes on. You never stop learning. Um, they're some of the important things I've learned. And by saying I've learnt about them means that I can actually talk about them. Yeah, it's already doing that. It's already taking over projects. Uh, we had a water project which I did on my own. It was really hard work. And now everyone's moving on. The tanks are moved and cleaned by the community. They, they, they value this service. So, still got to get the water in the tanks, but I, I'm never without help now. Uh, taking over, I think, I'd like to think that they've, they could take over more, and they will take over more, but I think we're looking at this, the generation I'm working with that are, are doing that. They're, they're, they're showing the way. They're showing their parents the way. So 
there's a piece of land next to the garbage dump which I really would like to rent in, which eventually I did. And my idea was to put the more vulnerable on there, knowing that, you know, the elderly are the most vulnerable. They get to a point where it's difficult to work. There's no one to look after them. They've got nowhere to go. So this piece of land, which is about three acres, and there's some families there that need the same assistance, especially the ones that have got the kids going to school. I wanted to kind of improve the overall conditions, and this is what this piece of land has done. The elderly can grow crops, they grow flowers, flowers they can sell, and then the kids have got a much cleaner, safer environment to play. We've got a little place there they can play football. Uh, we've got water that runs around it, so we've got irrigation. And it's been up and running now for about 18 months and the change has been phenomenal. You know, it's like they've got a place to live. It's always scary because you, we don't own the land, so we've got it for another year or 18 months. I'm hoping I can renew the lease. But seeing the difference of how people live and how much more comfortable they are, and the kids in particular, you know, they, they play together. But what I really need is some electric of some kind, solar lights. I'm really stuck for that because the kids can't do homework. The elderly can't see. New mothers with new babies. There's no electric uh, as such. So there's another challenge for us. But it works. That's the most important thing. It's, it's eased the tension and it's made people think about tomorrow, not just today. The scariest thing for me is the funding. We've already said it's not a lot of money, but the funding stops, kids don't go to school, people don't get fed. And that's it's my fault. <laughs> I did this. Uh, I got to be fair, there's a lot of people that do help me and they're all over the world. They're individuals though, they're not organisations. We've got an organisation in, in Thailand that does, is starting to help us and I'm really grateful to what they say to us, you know. But it's that karma thing, people are slowly moving in and it's better that it's individuals, not organisations, that come in and go, oh yeah, I can see what you're doing. I can do this. I'm here now in Ashland, Oregon, but the only way I could get here was because an Australian couple are covering for me for two weeks. They flew in. I'm not even going to see them when I go back. They're getting the kids to school, taking care of all those problems that they've dealt with. And I think they're having a blast. I know they're, having, they're enjoying it, but with the stress that comes with it. So that's two individuals that made a difference. And then there's a couple in uh, Canada that are helping out. And there's a person over here. And so those individuals make a huge difference. The lady in Canada is raising some money to pay for the teacher's wages. A huge difference. They're so, you know, no wages, no teaching. And we're talking only a few hundred dollars. So my fears are that it stops, but then again, you can't run around thinking that way. You've got to just keep going forward. Are you, are you thinking day-to-day -day stuff? Oh, I'm doing day-to-day. -day. <laughs> Trying to stop them doing it, and I'm doing it. Uh, I don't know, I just look forward to really hoping we just stay on path, on track, more of the same. More kids in school would be the best thing that could happen. Yeah, obviously the money is what keeps it driving forward and I'd love to be in a position where we didn't need the money. I'd just be happy to, if there's an alternative way, I would be very happy. But we do need money. Uh, manpower, yeah, we need some good teachers. When it comes to help, it's like, what do you got? Um, if you're a good teacher, but do we need teachers from this country or do we need Burmese teachers? Well, ideally, I'd like to see 
the Burmese and they're taking more interest and in being able to help themselves. But then when the foreigners come in, regardless of where they come from, not just teaching a specific subject, but ways of life, being more helpful in what you can do, you know, what's available out there for you. We get a lot of teachers, but we don't get, it's difficult to get much else, you know, we're not gonna get motor mechanics and hairdressers come over. So I guess the question and the point we're at is, well, I'm not quite sure, we'll push forward a little bit further and we'll see what it is that's needed. And that's probably our strength. We don't have that sort of planning that says, well, if we get this, it will solve that. That isn't the way it works. It's like, we need this and we can solve that. You understand that? It's not like, it's flexible. It's always okay. We're not rigid, we're gonna change direction. We thought we was gonna go that way and we needed this, but in fact, it's better if we go that way. Because other people come into it. It's not just me, other people come up with ideas. But more important is listening to what they're saying. They're telling me where to go and what to do. Well, it comes back to if you go with a plan and you're rigid, it's not going to work. Invariably, it's not going to work. So it's, it's a joint effort within the community. It's me and them together. And that's the listening part, that's the watching part. And if you don't have that time to sit around and, you know, and the kids are the ones that tell you because the kids are so honest. Um, they want everything, but you work out what they really want. And it was like I was saying to someone recently, kids in the United States or Australia, every you know, country in the world that's, you know, can, can have all this stuff, a kid will turn around and say, I want a toy, I want the latest robot or computer or whatever it is. My kids, I'll say, what do you want? They say, fruit. They want fruit. You can't say no. They want, they're hungry. 